If you would, please open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, we're going to look at verse 14 specifically this evening. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. And uh, I'll actually begin in, <clears throat> in verse 13 just to give some context uh, and because it is connected to verse uh, 14, uh, connected to that sentence and so that we get the full thought here of what Paul is trying to convey. So Paul says, beginning in verse 13, he says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Let us pray that God would bless the preaching of his word. Father, I thank you for the privilege to make known the truth of your word. I thank you for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for salvation in him. Father, I thank you for your mercy that is extended even toward the wicked to an extent. And I pray that as the word goes forth that you would show mercy upon the hearers and even me, that we would be conformed to the image of Christ, those of us who know him. And Father, I pray for those who are perhaps going to listen to this and be saved, or excuse me, who are unsaved, that they, my prayer is that they would be saved. And Father, I pray that chiefly Christ would be glorified as the truth of, of the gospel is made known, and that specifically my prayer is that as the, the um, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the pneumatology is, is explained, uh, parts of that is ex are explained, and um, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit, whose job is to glorify Christ and to magnify you, Father, would be himself glorified. And may he be lifted up, for he is the third person of the Trinity. He is Almighty God, and uh, to him we ascribe glory. We pray that you would do this on account of Christ. That's the only uh, way that we can approach you as sinners. That's the only way any of your people can approach you. So I pray for mercy, O God. And I, I pray that uh, you, Father, as well as the Spirit, would be brought the glory. And may Christ be brought the glory. May, may the triune God be glorified in the preaching of his word. Amen. And amen. Uh, as we conceive of salvation, uh, as we think about the issue, uh, the topic of soteriology, that is the study of salvation, we are often um, first uh, upon, uh, find ourselves dwelling upon the thought of the Father sending the Son to be the Savior of the world. And that's a biblical thought. We know that that's true uh, from places like John 3 and other, other places in Scripture, that God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Uh, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, he is the light of the world, uh, which is proceeded forth, or who has proceeded forth from the Father. But we also need to consider the role of the Spirit in salvation and His role in bringing about the salvation of God's particular people. And we find that here in Ephesians 1, Paul does that very thing. In fact, the last sermon I preached in this series on verse 13 discussed the work of the Spirit in sealing believers, that he is a seal of a Christian's salvation, that when someone is regenerated or they are born again and brought into God's kingdom, they are sealed by the Spirit and kept in Christ. In fact, Paul titled, uh, gave the Holy Spirit the title of Holy, the Holy Spirit of promise there in that verse. And here we find ourselves in verse 14, needing to revisit this blessed doctrine, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, in further detail, in greater detail, because Paul gives us more information. And brethren, it would be my exhortation to you to be students of this doctrine, to give yourselves to study these truths of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we now live in the age of the Holy Spirit, where He is most actively at work 
to a greater extent than he was under the Old Covenant dispensation. Brethren, we live in a a very great time indeed. We see that as we look down the corridor of church history, his workings amongst the children of men, bringing about the conversion of many sinful people, bringing them organized together as a body, the body of Christ. We find that he himself is the author, the originator of Reformation and Revival, that he himself has built up many churches by his own might and power, that he's enabled many preachers to preach with fervency and zeal and passion, that he has enabled many weak saints to lift up petition unto God. He himself has been mightily at work over the last few hundred, couple of thousand years to a great extent. He certainly was under the Old Testament dispensation. I don't want to say that he was not, but there has been a greater manifestation of his work. And so we would be very wise to go into the scriptures, to study them, and to search out the texts that speak to his work, to speak to his his role in salvation and in sanctification, which we will not be discussing uh, today, or looking at today, I should say. But it is important, very important, I would say, for the Christian to realize the Spirit's role in salvation. And we would all do well to understand the role of the Spirit of God in our own lives, how He has brought about salvation. Because as we know very clearly from this chapter, that salvation is not merely something that is brought about by one of the members of the Trinity. Rather, it is a work of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It is a work of the triune God. It is a work of the triune God, and that includes the Spirit. And so I want us to consider the Spirit's role in in pledging, uh, or being our pledge, I ought to say, and how that brings about a glorious truth, a, a glorious reality. That his pledging or his being our pledge is a is a promise of something greater, which we will one day receive in glory. And I want us to consider even how he is to receive the glory and salvation, for Paul ascribes it unto him in this verse. But before we do uh, these things, before we examine this passage in greater detail, of course, uh, I want us to briefly consider the context. And I, I covered it just for a moment there in the introduction. But in verse 13, Paul lays out the, the, the beginning, the, the groundwork of what he wants to say concerning the Spirit's work in salvation in verse 13. And if you'll notice, actually, the Spirit is the, the, the member of the Trinity that gets the least amount of um, time dedicated, or we, we might say uh, words dedicated to him here in this, in this chapter. However, what is said of him is very profound, very, very profound. It's very deep. In fact, one could dig into these verses and and pull out many precious jewels of truth. I could certainly turn these two verses into a a sermon series in and of themselves, but I want to keep a better pace going through this uh, book here. I mean, but Paul says there in verse 13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth... So again, Paul's speaking about the role of the Spirit in relation to believers... Uh, He says, after they've heard the message of truth, the, the, the gospel of your salvation, he says having also believed. So they hear the message of the gospel. That's the outward call. And as you recall, then they received the inward effectual call. They believed the gospel. They were recreated. They were given a new nature, new hearts, new desires, new affections. They were sealed in him. Sealed in Christ with who? Not with what, but with who? The Holy Spirit promise. And that doesn't end all that Paul wants to say there. But that's where we left off. So that brings us to the to the beginning of verse 14, to the doorstep, as it, as it were, to the porch here of verse 14. And so let's consider this verse. And it breaks up very nicely into three sections. The, the first section is uh, about a pledge and an inheritance. A pledge and an inheritance. Uh, the second section is about a heavenly redemption. A heavenly redemption. And then the third uh, section is is the end of Trinitarian salvation. Or we might even say the end of the Spirit's role in salvation. Um, And so let's look at the first one. A a, a pledge and an inheritance. A pledge and an inheritance. First, let's consider the pledge and how the Spirit is that pledge. Look with me, verse 14. 
He says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance? Who? Who is... Who is who here in this verse? Well, if we just simply remove the verse uh, mark there, or remove the, the the number 14, because that's of no significance, that's not an inspired thing. We know that the uh, chapter marks and even the verse marks were later put in. And so this flood is a sentence, very clearly. He says, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given? This is the spirit that Paul is referencing here, as we know from verse uh, 13. But we also know from other places in Scripture that Paul is speaking of the Spirit as our pledge, that the Spirit himself is our pledge. Not just providing a pledge or or uh, bringing a pledge to us. No, rather, he himself is the pledge. Paul tells us elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, he says concerning God that he gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Almost word for word what he says here in verse 14 of Ephesians 1. Then in 2 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says, God who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Again, they're identifying that the Spirit himself is a pledge. We need to remember that we do not, we, it is irreverent. In fact, we might even say outright sinful to speak of the Spirit as non-personal, you know, that it is Him. When we speak of Him, He is a person. He is the person of the Trinity. He Himself is our pledge. It's not it's our pledge. It is He is our pledge. And that's important. That's important. Language does matter. The way we speak of God matters, for it reveals what we believe about God. Jesus said, whatever comes out of the, out of the mouth is what is within the heart. And so we need to be sure that our hearts and our minds are attuned to biblical truth, that we are in line with the Word of God and what it teaches concerning the triune God. We know from um, verse, four, uh, verse 13, as, as I um, preached on last time, uh, we were in this series, as we were looking at these, this series of verses here, that it's the Spirit who brings this salvation that Christ has procured to us personally, it, it it brings it to me, because we we look at we look at the gospel, we look at the truth of Christ, and, and the the question might arise: Okay, how, I understand Jesus did that, but how does how does that come to me? How is that brought to me? How does that come to personally affect me? And it's the work of the Spirit, as we know. Jesus said in John three eight, "The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it." but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. There is this mysterious work of the Spirit. There's an aspect in which we will not fully understand His work in the saving of a soul. But one of those things that we can't understand and we can't grasp, for it is put forth very plainly in Scripture, is that He is given as our as our seal, yes, but also as a pledge, as a pledge for us. Before we consider the essence of that pledge, we need to remember that he's given as a gift. For Paul says there, verse 14, who is given? Who is given? We know that the Father has given the Son to the world to save that very world to which he was given. Um, a very popular verse, First John, or excuse me, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There is a giving of the Son by the Father. Likewise, by the Father and the Son, there is a giving of the Spirit, a sending forth of the Spirit. Jesus said it this way to his disciples before, very close to his crucifixion, right before. Verse, uh, John chapter 14, he says in verse 16, I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. So Jesus says, I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to send the spirit of truth. And of course we know from the context of that verse, he's talking to disciples, but disciples, they were believers. They had the spirit, they were regenerate. But there was a greater manifestation of the Spirit that was 
later to take place. We know that that happened at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And this is something that we experience immediately in conversion. It's not, it's not a post-conversion experience. We are sealed immediately, and we are also immediately granted this great gift of the Spirit's pre- presence in our lives And he is our pledge. He is a pledge from God to us. To us. And it is a gift of grace. It is a gift of grace. What is the essence of this pledge, though? We know that it is a gift of grace, certainly. But what is the essence of it? For Paul says, who is given as a pledge. Well, the Greek word for pledge here is arabon, and it means an earnest, a pledge, a down payment, as the Holman Christian Standard Bible uh, renders it. It's actually derived from a Hebrew word, which root, which at its root, excuse me, means a surety, a surety. It's got the idea of a down payment. And that's that's a more contemporary term, something that we can better understand and relate to. The idea of a down payment that you are. You're giving something as a, uh, we might say a pledge even, or as a surety, that one day you're going to give more. You're going to continue to give. Perhaps, you know, we think of it in the context of buying a home. A home which would be, of course, out of one's price range at the time, the money that they had in their possession. So they would make a down payment on it, on it and then each month would pay their mortgage until they paid the house off and then it's actually theirs. A similar idea is carried with this, uh, with this word. Uh, with this word, outer bone, that we have been given a pledge from God. The Spirit is our pledge that we are going to receive something even greater one day. That when we pass from this world to the next, or uh, whether that be through death, or by the return of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to get us, we ourselves will receive a heavenly inheritance. The Spirit's presence in our lives, the Spirit's uh, enabling us to pray, enabling us to share the gospel with boldness, to memorize scripture, to rejoice always, to serve with gladness and joy. The Spirit's work in our lives, in all its manifold manifestations, is but a pledge of what is to be received one day. A glorious inheritance in heaven. Matthew Henry speaks of the Spirit's work in the life of the believer in relation to this earnest, in relation to this pledge, in his commentary by saying this, The Spirit's illumination is an earnest of everlasting light. Sanctification is an earnest of perfect holiness. And his comforts are earnests of everlasting joys. He is said to be the earnest until the redemption of the purchased possession. It may be called here the possession because this earnest makes it as sure as the heirs, excuse me, as sure to the heirs as though they were, they were already possessed of it and it is purchased for them by the blood of Christ. So Matthew Henry there says that the Spirit's work and presently in the life of the believer, being our pledge is as if we already possess those things we are one day going to receive in heaven. That's how powerful his ministry is in the life of the Christian. And we can be assured that those things are going to be ours because ultimately our possession of those things is founded upon the blood of Christ as Matthew Henry highlights there, and he bases that, of course, off of what Paul says in verse seven of this chapter: "In him you have, rede- excuse me, in him we have redemption through his blood. We have redemption. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is the shedding of blood, Christ's blood, namely, that is the basis for our heavenly inheritance." that we will one day receive. Paul says also in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 23, And not only this, but we also, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit. Interesting he uses that term, first fruits. 
That carries with it the idea that there's more to come. There's more fruits coming. These are just the beginning. He says, the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. I thought we've already become children of God. Certainly we have, but there is a sense in which there's a future. There's a, there's a future experience that has yet to be enjoyed. Being the children of God. There's something that awaits us. There's much that awaits us. Indeed, indeed. In fact, some interesting note on Romans 8, just briefly. Some theologians and Bible scholars have denoted Romans 8 as the Holy Spirit's chapter. And there's, there's a lot there um, when we consider the Spirit's work. But it has more to do with the, 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 the aspect of sanctification. Um, and not necessarily salvation. Although there are things in there that speak of that. Speak of salvation. I want to consider just briefly this inheritance. This inheritance. Because Paul talks about it after this. Uh, because he says, uh, in verse 14 of Ephesians 1, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. I want to consider just a couple of aspects, or a couple of things about this inheritance. Uh, one, who is it? Whose is it? It's ours. Because Paul says there, it is our inheritance. It is not something which, uh, which, is, which was someone else's and now given to us. It has, as it were, had its name written upon itself since the foundation of the world. For God has, before the world was made, determined to save us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to make us rich in Him spiritually. To make us rich in spiritual blessings. To make us heirs of the kingdom. Co-heirs with Christ. Hallelujah to God for this great mercy. Hallelujah to Him for His grace toward us, toward His, toward his people. This inheritance is the church's. It is every believer's. It is their right to own it, to cling to it. It is our right by birth, for we have been born again, born into the kingdom by divine grace. He says, our inheritance. What is the essence of this inheritance? What is the essence of it? Well, it is entrance into God's presence, chiefly. Because we as sinners have been separated from the presence of God. But now, being redeemed by Christ, we have been brought into a right standing before God. And therefore, we now have access to His presence now on earth. But there will be one day when we will fully be in His presence. Heaven, that's what he makes heaven heaven, is the presence of of the glory of God. And it will be great. It will indeed. Paul talks about it in second, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'd, I'd invite you to turn there. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. So Paul speaks of this. He actually, interestingly enough, speaks about this future inheritance as, um, um, or excuse me, he speaks of it in relation to the, the work of the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough. In, in the context of these verses. So beginning in verse 6 there, he says, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a, minis a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the, a before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they understood it, if they would, if they had not understood it, or if they um, would have understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. Uh, this inheritance can only be spoken of in. Terms that are inadequate because there's a sense in which no eye has seen or ear has heard of the things that God has prepared for those who love Him in heaven. For those who are Christ's, He has an innumerable amount, an innumerable amount of blessings for them in glory. For He loves His bride with an incorruptible love and she loves Him with that incorruptible love.
which he enabled her to love him with. Incredibly enough. And this inheritance is closely linked with God himself. This inheritance is closely linked with God himself. For the psalmist says, Psalm 72, 4, Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance. Tribe of your inheritance. He speaks of the inheritance of God. It is from God, of God, by God, and for God. We might even say it is God himself. We're going to be in the kingdom of God. We're going to be in the presence of God. It all goes back to God. We're going to forever enjoy the presence of God. I said this earlier, heaven will not be heaven. Heaven is not heaven without God. God is what makes heaven wonderful, glorious, powerful. A place of joyful bliss because God himself abides there. Secondly, a heavenly redemption. A heavenly redemption. A heavenly redemption. And as I mentioned already, this 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 salvation, this uh this inheritance that we have is in heaven. It is sealed in glory for us. Paul even says it this way in Ephesians 2. We'll go over there for briefly. He says, verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. He's speaking of God's work here. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us who are in Christ Jesus. He raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. It's as if we've already been raised up and, and, and placed in heaven at the right hand of the Father with Christ. We've already been seated in the heavenly places with Christ where Christ is, which is at the right hand of the Father. Not that we ourselves take that position, but that we are near him where he is. So it is a heavenly redemption. And it is an eschatological, it is an end times uh, nature. Uh, it, it occurs with the idea of an end times salvation. For after Paul says inheritance in verse 14, going back there to Ephesians 1, he says, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. That term, with a view, carries with it the idea, those three words, a future thing. It's looking forward to something that is to come. And, and as already um, stressed throughout this sermon, that the idea of, of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of a seal, or excuse me, of a pledge by the Spirit in earnest, um, which the Spirit is himself, our pledge, or our earnest, or a down payment, carries with it the idea that there's something else is going to come. And so Paul just further stresses that with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. And there is an end times uh, reality to our salvation. We have been saved, and that salvation, which we have already experienced in the past, is going to have an end. And the end is our final glorification or our final salvation because we are being saved and are yet to be saved. We can speak of it in those terms. And that salvation, final salvation is soon to come. I love what the last chapter of all Scripture says in um, Revelation chapter 22, in verse uh, 3. It says, there will, be, uh, excuse me, there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. Speaking of the, the, new, uh, the new Jerusalem. Excuse me. And his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and there will, and excuse me, and they will have no need of the light of a lamp, 
or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Uh, th this is what we have been saved to. This is the end to which we have been saved, that one day we're going to arrive in this state in, in final uh, glorification, in, in, in final uh, glory. And the new heavens and the new earth will be there. God and the Lamb will illumine God's people, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and they themselves will reign forever and ever. This is something that we as children of God experience by grace. And if, briefly, if you yourself are not a Christian, then I would encourage you to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him so that you be, will become a partaker of this, that you yourself will inherit these glorious realities along with all the rest of the people of God. By grace. It is all by grace. There is a future aspect to this. This pledge is pointing forward to this end. To this end that we will be with God and He will be with us forevermore. With a view to the redemption of of God's own possession. To the redemption of God's own possession. Remember, we are God's possession. We are His and not our own. We do not own ourselves. Rather, He owns us. We are His creation. And beyond that, we who are redeemed are His possession in Christ. For as Paul says in Ephesians 1, four, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Before him. With a view to the redemption of God's own possession. And so he now possesses us in one day, as I read from Revelation, we will be in his presence. So we see here eternity to eternity, eternity past to eternity future. We are God's. He owned us before we were born. He had our names, as it were, in his mind. He already determined to save us. And now we've been redeemed in time. And one day we'll be brought into eternal glory. And we will be in his presence forever. Lastly, the third point is the end of Trinitarian salvation. The end of of Trinitarian salvation. Or specifically, we, we could even say, and as I, as I said at the beginning, we can uh, tweak that a little bit and say, the end of the, the Spirit's role in salvation, we might say. Uh, the end of the Spirit's role in salvation. This is the Spirit's jealousy for His own glory. Because what does it say at the end there? Um, to the praise of His glory. And we know specifically that's speaking of the, the Holy Spirit, His work in salvation. But greater, and that's why I named this, uh, or titled this last point, the end of Trinitarian salvation. The greater context could mean, certainly, and it and, and does, that this is about the triune God as well, j just as much as it is about in the triune God in verse 6 and in verse 12, when speaking of the Father and the Son in their work in redemption. Because we know that if, if the Spirit is getting glory, the triune God is getting glory. If the Father is receiving glory, the, the triune God is receiving glory. If the Son is, is receiving glory, the, the triune God is receiving glory. That's just a specific member within the, the Godhead that is highlighted there. And so the, the, the praise of His glory, that, that is that the Spirit has brought this about so that He Himself might receive the glory and might receive the praise and the honor. But He Himself might be honored, that he might be adored because of this, because of what he's done in saving, redeeming, and being the pledge for a particular people uh, to the end, uh, excuse me, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. Indeed. So, may he be glorified in our lives. May he be glorified in all that we do, knowing now, especially in light of the reality, that he himself is our pledge. Is our pledge. He is a pledge of our inheritance. And we know, of course, from, as I mentioned, verse 6, verse 12, now verse 14, 
that Paul has brought when he has said full circle, and he brings this section of this book to uh, a close. This section of this first chapter is finished. He has sufficiently and thoroughly covered the work of each of the members of the Trinity in salvation. And at the, each, of the, each of those sections, the fathers, the sons, and the spirits, he has highlighted the fact that salvation is ultimately to the end that God might be glorified. As we know from passage like Romans 11.36, that the glory of God is the chief end of salvation, and we might even say, and we can say with great authority and with great conviction, that it is the chief end of all things, of the creation of your soul and mine. The creation of all things is to the glory of God. And here we see, in verse 14 specifically, that the Spirit possesses a specific jealousy for His own glory, just as the Father and the Son does. So does the Spirit. The Spirit is jealous for His own glory. One of His operations is to bring glory to the Son and to point people to look to Him through the eye of faith, the eyes of faith, and to pray to the Father. And so typically we find that uh, the Father and the Son are highlighted more than the Spirit in Scripture, but the Spirit is still worthy of all glory, honor, praise, and adoration. And even, uh, He is to be prayed to even, at times, to be prayed to. And that's perfectly acceptable to do so. But as mentioned, these three passages beautifully unite together in, in the trifecta of doxology, of uh, praise to God. Paul's Paul's recognizing that God has done this for His glory. For His glory. Amen and amen. Praise God for that. A few exhortations I'd like to address to you, uh, to give to you, in light of these truths. Uh, Brethren, what I would encourage you to do is to firstly rejoice. Firstly rejoice. The truth ought to cause us to rejoice we don't first uh, attempt to obey and to, 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 to walk in holiness before God and then think we're going to have joy after we look back upon our performance, as it were, as if that is the basis of joy. Rather, we look at God and look at God's truth and have joy in our hearts spring forth and then, because of that joy, obey God. One is grace-filled biblical Christianity. The other would be an empty, rote legalism. Brethren, we must remember these realities and let them bring joy to our hearts. That the Spirit is our pledge. And it is a pledge, or He is a pledge, excuse me, of our inheritance that we're going to receive one day. As Mr. Matthew Henry pointed out, it is as if we already have it. So it's as, if, it's as if we already have the possession itself, or excuse me, the, the inheritance itself. So let that fill you with joy, whether you are young or old, whether you are afflicted, or right now in life the afflictions are light. Brethren, let these truths encourage your hearts in Christ Jesus. Now, after that, in light of these things, trust and rely upon the Spirit. Trust and rely upon the Spirit. And there are many ways and many situations in which this might uh, take place. Uh, so many that I could not certainly cover them all, but a few, of course, is prayer. Prayer is one of the, uh, the ways, uh, or excuse me, one of the things which the Spirit aids us in. We are to pray at all times in the Spirit, as Paul tells us. Pray at all times in the Spirit. He tells us in that, in that sixth chapter of this book. We are to pray at all times in the Spirit. We know from Romans 8, the Spirit aids us in our weaknesses. For when we don't know how to pray, He enables us, uh, with, it gives us these groanings too deep for words. He gives us an earnestness in our prayers, a zeal, a burden, a passion, a brokenness even. So I would encourage you to pray. Pray, pray, pray. I would encourage you also, to any, when you find yourself, and you're certainly going to, if you're an obedient Christian, you're going to find yourself in evangelistic situations where you must share the gospel with someone. Whether that be out on the streets handing out tracts, or um, perhaps even those of you who are gifted to preach, maybe men, open-air preachers, or um, perhaps uh, even you, you mothers or, or women who are um, 
even witnessing your own children, sharing the gospel with your own children. Rely on the Spirit to give you that boldness. We find that in the book of Acts, we look at Peter and Paul and the other apostles uh, making Christ known with boldness to these Gentiles, uh, their fellow countrymen, the Jewish uh, nation. Uh, the, 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 they were or the Jewish people. They, they were they were bold. They they were they were powerfully zealous. How could it be? How could it be? Because the Spirit was at work in them. And they relied upon Him to give them strength and to give them the zeal and the passion to, to share the gospel. To share the gospel with those who were lost. So there's just a couple of expectations for you, brethren. Just a couple. And many more I could give, certainly. I want to address briefly, though, those of you who are church attenders, and perhaps uh, I, you, you are nominal Christians, you are Christians in name only. And you may say, well, um, how does this text even deal with a false convert or, or someone who's simply a Christian in name only? It certainly does. These truths do. They affect the, un, they, they affect the unregenerate churchgoer. Because many of you, while claiming to be Christians, do not ever look to these truths and are in any way encouraged by them. Or perhaps you are, but you take these truths as it were and stand upon them as if they were a stool, but continue in your sin and use these truths as justification for your sinful lifestyle. Saying, well, God is gracious and I have the pledge of the Spirit. He is in me and He is the pledge of this inheritance that I will receive one day. And nothing can remove that from me. Therefore, I can do as I wish. I can live however I please I can be a carnal Christian, to put that in quotation marks, and I will be fine. My only reply would be, no, you are a fool, and you need to be saved in Christ. You who think such need to be redeemed. I implore you to call upon the name of the Lord and to be saved from your sin, to be saved in Christ alone. Lastly, any of you who are just outright unbelievers, who do not take any interest in spiritual things, but have found yourself listening to this sermon one way or another, or perhaps if it is one day transcribed in the providence of God, maybe reading it, I'm not sure. But you have come upon this and are now listening to me as I communicate to you the importance of your own soul the value of your own soul. Do not lose your soul. Our Lord Jesus said, for what can a man give in exchange for his soul? He himself said in Matthew 5, if your eye causes you to stumble, take it out, remove it, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, chop it off. Do uh, commit personal amputation to limbs if they bring about your sinning against God. Do so with the uttermost zeal. Zeal for the Lord of hosts. Friend, I encourage you. I plead with you to turn from sin and to turn to the Son of God. And you will be a partaker of these realities. The Spirit will come and seal you and save you. He will be your pledge of your inheritance that you will receive because you are now God's possession because He ordained to possess you in Christ. And it will all be to the praise of His glory, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Amen. And amen. The God spoken of in these verses is holy. Verse 13, He is the Holy Spirit of promise. We often read that and oh, how we overlook the reality of His holiness. We find in books like Leviticus that the holiness of God is greatly stressed for us. And we ought to ponder that reality. We ought to dwell upon that fact that God is holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. He has a vengeance for righteousness. For he has a zeal for righteousness, I would say, and he takes vengeance upon his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The clouds of the dust beneath his feet, as Nahum 1 says. 
and he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is his way. He is gracious, yes, as I mentioned in my opening prayer, he shows mercy even toward the wicked. He is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-powerful. He possesses all power. And in that holiness, he gave his law, first in the garden, to Adam, and Adam fell and broke God's law. It was later republished at Mount Sinai. You shall not lie, steal, fornicate, but we've done these things, and therefore we deserve hell. And you know, your conscience tells you that you have done these things. All mankind is in this state of helplessness, born into a state of total depravity, and hatred for the things of God, at war with God and at enmity with Him. This is the state of the lost. But God, being rich in mercy, chose to save a people to Himself chose a people to be his own possession, to save in his Son. And when the right time came, his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, entered into time and lived a perfect life on behalf of the elect. He fulfilled the law for them. He died for them. He was raised on the third day for them and was seated at the right hand of the Father 40 days later for them. Upon the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of the Father was unleashed upon the sins of God's people. For Christ was wrapped in the sins of his people, we might say. He was credited with having broken the laws we have. And so the call of the gospel is that you must repent and believe it. It's interesting that scripture says you must do that, but yet we know also scripture clearly says they are granted to the sinner by God, insinuating that the sinner cannot, in any way by his own strength, bring these things about. And that is true. It is all by grace. 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 But there is still personal responsibility. One must repent and believe. And the promise is that they will be forgiven of sin and wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, which he fulfilled, which he lived out in his perfect life. And the reason they can be forgiven is because he died for the sins of those people. This is divine grace. This is divine grace. Grace abounding. Grace abounding. This gospel is not only for the lost, but for the saints to be encouraged by daily. So for those of you who are Christians, I encourage you to feed upon this daily as your delight, your joy. And for those who are converted, they have new hearts, new desires, new affections, new inclinations, a hatred for the things that God detests and a love for the things that God approves of, a love of holy things, not of, not out of drudgery, not out of, not out of a spirit of slavery, rather a spirit of freedom, freedom in Christ. For when one is the slave of Christ, they are truly free. It is all by grace. To the end that God himself might be, the glory, might be brought to glory. And that is the purpose of all things. The purpose of this great salvation. The purpose of this wondrous reality of the Spirit's being our pledge. The Spirit being our pledge. It is the glory of God. So may God be brought the glory in all things, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, for the powerful, effective word of God, that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it penetrates even dividing to soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. 
but I find myself in need of repentance over my own irreverence toward you and my own disbelief of your truth. O oh God, create in me a clean heart. Bless your people as a result of these things. Save those who are lost. And may you, by your providential workings, bring glory to your holy name. Father, may you, may Christ, may the Spirit, may the triune God be brought glory in all things forever. Amen. And amen. And amen.